Excellent. So yeah, hello everyone. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining. My name is Cesar Quintana. I am a principal solutions architect here at Ops Cruise, and I am joined today uh, by Matt Sarabian, um, uh, engineering manager uh, at Avis Budget Zipcar. So uh, you know we're here today to talk about uh, uh, Avis's digital transformation and how um, they are leveraging uh, Ops Cruise as part of their observability stack. Um, and, you know, with that, leveraging the open source tools um, that, you know, many of them are part of this, you know, Linux Foundation's, you know, CNCF project. So um, I will let Matt introduce himself as well, but uh, just a little bit of my background. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a principal solutions architect. I've been in the observability space for, for a good, uh, probably going on 10 years at this point. Um, yeah, and I've been in the IT field for over 15, so it's 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 been uh quite a while uh, that I've been around and I've seen a lot of things change and uh, open sources, you know, some of the coolest stuff that I get to work with day in, day out, a lot of Kubernetes. So uh, really excited to be here with you guys. And uh, I will let Matt introduce himself. Go ahead, Matt. Hey, y'all. Well, my name is Matt. I'm an engineering manager at, at Zipcar and Avis Budget Group. And um, I've kind of waffled between building products and working as a consultant to help other people build products um, for, for a while now. Uh, I've worked on some pretty uh, large scale web properties like tmz.com um, and I've done IT administration kind of traditionally before all the cool cloud stuff came around um, and I've been a full stack engineer as well. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so um, so so as we mentioned, I'll, we'll kind of jump right into it. Uh, but uh, as mentioned, Avis is doing a big uh, in, in the middle of a big uh, transformation project by leveraging Kubernetes, leveraging open source. Matt will talk more about that. And um, And one of the things that uh, that was done is that they started leveraging the open source tools, but still saw a gap for some of the things like a smart layer and data unification um, for the, all these observability tools. Um, so uh, as is part of any transformation project, um, there are some uh, issues that you get away from as you move to a new architecture, but you know, as you leave some issues behind, you open up some new problems. And, and uh, thankfully we were able to partner with Avis to uh, help them solve some of those new observability gaps that were created. Um, you know, as the migration to the new project uh, moved. So, uh, with that, um, first we'll let you know Matt talk a little bit about that project, how they're leveraging open source, and then how they can obscures and some of the stuff that they do with obscures. And then what we'll do is uh, I will give you a brief tour of what obscures is, and we'll do a demo and and then jump into Q and A. So, uh, I know that uh, as was mentioned earlier, there's a chat box for Q and A. Um, so please feel free to ask uh, ask questions away, and if it's um, uh, and if it's something we can answer on the spot, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll lead it to uh, to the towards the Q and A uh, portion of the uh, of the session. So, with that, Matt, I will uh, give it to you. Go ahead. Hey, yo. Um, so, as you may or may not know, uh, Zipcar is is owned by Avis, but we're a pretty large multinational company. Zipcar also operates in a couple countries, um, and you know we had had kind of a large technical footprint right at Avis it's it's been a company that's been around a while they've got mainframes that'll probably never go away and maybe some of you can relate to that um, at Zipcar being a little bit newer of a company um, we were kind of first into the cloud uh, we adopted containers really early and we had a hybrid cloud environment uh, when we were acquired by Avis and we had kind of a path to bring everything into the cloud um, where it pretty much is today and you know our mantra of building out that platform at Zipcar, and and that continued as we started thinking how to bring Avis to the cloud was you know how do we find the parts of the platform that are most commoditized in either the open source space or the the marketplace um, because we wanted to stop doing those things ourselves if the stuff in the market and the stuff that was out there was doing it better because you know generally as platform engineers it's hard to know sometimes when you're adding value and it's never a case that you're adding value to an organization by competing with Amazon or a large open source project that's obviously winning um, in the market. And so, you know, what we what we wanted to do is find things like EKS to allow us to leverage a great container runtime, um, and then we could kind of bring teams into that new cloud native way of working. So teams that traditionally were maybe on prem in virtual machines, kind of doing that you stand up the infrastructure, you have this provisioning step, and there's various levels of automation involved. We wanted to go to a full GitOps 
people are making pull requests, we're building artifacts in dev and we're pushing it across all the environments. You know, there's no such thing as a pre-prod build or a prod build anymore. There's a container that's built in dev and we push it out in a controlled manner. And the idea is if you do that, you incentivize teams to do kind of small controlled release uh, instead of big giant formal releases where release managers may or may not have context for all the technical changes. You want rapid iteration and the ability to release 24 seven, whether or not a team is going to decide to release on 4 PM on a Friday, you know, <laughs> maybe we'll leave that to them to decide, but they could. And that's, what's important about delivering, you know, reliable platform. And, you know, at this time we were like, okay, how do we do this in a way that's affordable? Um, and our early decision based on what we had learned through Zipcar was like, we're going to keep as many things lean as possible, right? We don't want to have a big steep curve here because cloud native is new for a lot of these folks. They're moving from an environment. Um, <laughs> why do you say that mainframes will never, may never go away? Uh, generally because legacy applications pay our checks um, and it's very hard to move off of them, but we're trying it at Avis and we're making some good progress. And the big part is if you're used to building those kind of things, you want people um, that know their applications to be able to worry about writing application code and not have to think about the platform or necessarily monitoring on day one. The 90% use case that we find is developers want to know, is my app up? Is it, does its networking working as it's supposed to? Is routing working? What's its resource consumption? How much CPU, how much memory? You know, those are the things that generally get people through the majority of early development. And then later they say, oh, you know, I really like this custom metric or there's this specific piece of business logic that we might test. And so we wanted to be able to add those things on as teams moved through that maturity model. And we kind of wanted to skip that awkward stage that some companies have to go through when they move to the cloud where it's like, everybody's kind of doing it a little different. Do you really have a containerized microservice or do you have like kind of a VM that's been stuffed into a Docker file? Um, and it's like golden and there's secrets in there. Like how do you go all the way uh, cloud native? Um, and so at Avis, you know, there was a team that was really ripe for this. They, they presented a great organizational inflection point for us. And that was the connected car team. They were definitely feeling the pain of slow iteration cycles. They were hosted on a VM on-prem they had dependencies on the mainframe, but they themselves were not yet, you know, tightly, tightly coupled to the mainframe. And they had experience with some degree of open source monitoring already. So we looked at this and they were, they were excited to kind of modernize. And so we worked together and we all kind of learned, we, we paired with them, our platform team, their app development team learned a lot of the cloud native stuff together. We had tons of executive support to get this done. And in the end, we had a totally, you know, CI CD environment. Developers could spin up ephemeral namespaces, copies of their services that were totally isolated to test with, move through each of the environments with tests and monitoring and alerts, and all those kind of major use cases that people coming from VMs were, were used to being able to debug and look into. And that was super cool. Um, you know, everything we had at that point was completely open source. We hadn't coupled with anybody yet. We kind of really wanted to stay focused. We didn't do any POCs. We weren't looking for additional things because people weren't ready for them yet. And this was great. It allowed us to really control costs. We were able to show a lot of success when we were doing this. Um, and we had a lot of wins here. Like we adopted Loki for logs really early on. At Zipcar, we'd been using uh, Elkstack. And Elkstack is cool, but I have a personal pet peeve of it. I think most developers don't actually want full text search. They don't want like stop words removed and periods removed. They just kind of want to like grep on logs, but we call it full text search. And a lot of people like that sticks. Um, the downside about moving away from Elk, and there's only really one, uh, we saved tons and tons of money. Obviously a 40 node elastic search cluster for logs is, is pretty wild. Zipcar was generating, I think about two terabytes or so of logs a month. So um, it's quite a lot. And, with Elk, we didn't really have to worry about how our developers use logs. Um, they would search for stuff if their thing was not full text searchable because it had you know punctuation in it or words that were going to be removed. They didn't always get great results, but they figured it out. And by and large, it just worked. It was expensive, but it worked. With Loki, we had to kind of spend some time and really learn how our developers wanted to query logs so we could tune it right. So in the end, 
that pain point is certainly worth what we're saving. I mean, our logs today cost basically nothing compared to you know the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they cost us when we were running uh, Minilk Stack. Prometheus, I would be shocked if anybody on this call hadn't heard of Prometheus. Really cool. Um, there's lots of open source support for it. It's built in exporters. We can get metrics from tons of sources. So that was kind of a no brainer for us. And as I mentioned, the connected car team, which was our, our initial team that was, was going cloud native and, and moving all their stuff in there, they already had some experience with it. So it was, it was a great use case for us and it's performed really well. Grafana, it's kind of incendiary. Some people love it, some people hate it. Some people say it's really hard to build dashboards. Some people say it's really easy to build dashboards. Now there's open source dashboards you can load by ID. So it's a mixed bag. Generally, it worked really well for us. Um, there were open source dashboards we used. Teams, as they got a little further and started making their own Prometheus metrics, they made custom dashboards. But it kind of was still like you're going around in different places in Grafana. And if you don't know where to look, it can be a little bit hard to find information sometimes. And Istio and Kiali, great open source projects as well. Um, mostly in the beginning, all we really needed were Envoy features. A lot of people you know, were excited to deploy Istio, but it wasn't until um, it wasn't until we really needed true service mesh, like service to service communication governance that we had to actually deploy those things, but they're working great. Um, there is a question that's just come through and I'd like to answer it live. It's about uh, infrastructure as code for Grafana dashboards. That's a great uh, question. So while we were doing this, this was the one con of Grafana. We were like, oh man, like, how are we going to do this? And so in Kubernetes, we had config maps and we had everybody commit their source code, um, all the JSON, they'd like build the dashboard, export the JSON and commit it back into the repo. And then when Kubernetes would deploy Grafana, our automation would, you know, see that and generate the config maps. And this kind of uh, was awful because it worked, right? Don't get me wrong. It got people used to committing dashboards as version control, which is awesome. It definitely was able to, it was definitely able to load everything into Grafana that way, but it was cumbersome. And if people were new to it, they didn't always know where to go. And if they forgot to export it out of Grafana, you missed it. In the end, um, what we ended up doing with Grafana is just hooking it into RDS as a, back, as a backing store. And now, uh, and, and we'll kind of talk about this a little bit. Now we have more people on our platform. Um, we just say, hey, we encourage you to commit these into your repos. It's good to have a copy of the JSON, but we're going to back, back feed it into RDS. And now people just kind of edit it as they like. So in a little bit, we lost that battle. Um, we still commit ours to source control. Uh, the problem is when you do that, you can't edit it in the Grafana app. So that, that is a bit of a learning curve there. That's definitely a pain point for us. And this is cool. Like in the end, you know, other teams wanted this. They were like, this is amazing. We had a lot of success. We had a lot of open source team, a lot of open source wins. And other teams are like, I want to be able to iterate like that. I want, you know, to be able to get all of these different things and, and move my team forward. So that was, that was great for us. The problem is we we're talking about that 90% use case. And now this is like the 10%, right? In connected car, we work together. We were like completely embedded. And now there were lots of new teams and maybe they were brand new to this. Some of them were brand new to Git. And so to move to fully cloud native, you know, you have to fetch your secrets at runtime. Everything's containerized. It's Kubernetes, it's Docker files. It's everything that you're not used to if you've been building applications on a mainframe or, you know, FTPing or SCPing jars and WAR files to, to VMs. And and people didn't always know what to monitor. Like, sure, we had open telemetry, but what are they going to monitor? Um, a lot of people had never seen a lot of these tools before. And CNCF and the Linux Foundation has great trainings. Um, and that's, you know, an awesome resource. But if you're selling people on a platform of being rapid iteration and they get there and there's a cliff they have to climb, it's a bit, it's a bit tough. Um, and then we had teams that wanted more advanced features like tracing. Most of the time, what we've found is like, if a team doesn't have, like a t if a team doesn't have a truly microservices architecture, it can be hard to use tracing. Like a lot of teams, I think, if left to their own devices, and this is not an Avis critique, this is like, I think generally engineering teams tend to build distributed monoliths. Um, you know, especially if they're pulling from something monolithic, like you think you're breaking it up. And then when you're actually done and you look at what you've built, if a bunch of things need to be versioned together all the time, 
it's not necessarily as as cloud native microservice as it could be. And I think you know we'll talk a little bit about how OpsCruise kind of solves this this high level need for dependency maps um, and getting people to kind of see where these tight couplings may exist. And also we had this issue of okay now there's all these other teams when connected car came. They already had a plan, right? They had something they were wanted to break up. Everybody agreed on the architecture. We were involved at that point, but now there's too many teams for us to be involved with every single one. How do we make sure that what the architectural committee, you know, agreed to and what was, you know, rubber stamped is actually what was built? Generally, you know, our saying is like, if your architecture diagram isn't live, it's probably out of date. Somebody may have changed it. Um, and this is where Opscrews kind of came in for us. We had this high level issue of like. Now that we have all these different things on here, who's going to tell us if our monitoring stuff is down? Um, and OpsCruise is the great, great partner for that. They're an external entity. And if our open telemetry stops flowing to them, we can get an alert that says something's wrong with your Prometheus, um, which has happened. You know, we've had Prometheus storage fill up on one of our replicas. And we've been able to see like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> There's a problem with our Prometheus. Some people will tell you in Kubernetes, uh, you can't monitor the cluster that you're trying to you know, observe into. And if you're running that monitoring stack on that cluster and people will tell you, you need a second monitoring cluster to do that. The problem is um, then you have two clusters <laughs> to manage and who watches that cluster. So in our case, having a partner like Opscrews had always kind of, uh, has always kind of been a goal of ours to be able to have something watching our stuff so that we know, hey, we're not getting any alerts right now. Is everything fine? No, alert manager is down. <laughs> so the other thing is that open source support. So we're bringing in a lot of new tools and new teams. Um, and the learning process, you know, as, as we've just been asked in, in the Q&A, is something that we're still working through. What we kind of did is identified like eight key points that were necessary. And some of them were cloud native things like why database migration tools are good and why you have to fetch container. Uh, secrets at runtime and you shouldn't put them in deployments and you know general git workflow stuff and others are more based on specific tools we picked like how to write a mapping to do routing in ambassador for envoy and things like that so we kind of identified this like eight point bullet list that we try to have teams select into and if if the team is going to start deploying stuff and it's in containers and they either have somebody on the team or many people on the team that know most of the things on that list they're going to be able to move fast. If they don't and they need to learn all those things, you set the expectation with leadership that like they will move fast eventually, but don't set aggressive deadlines because everything is new. Um, and managing that learning process is definitely a challenge, uh, Suresh. So you definitely have, you know, we haven't integrated Jaeger yet because a lot of the teams are still not at that point of doing full distributed tracing. But what OpsCruise has let us do is kind of look and see how our services are talking to each other at a high level, which is just as good for a lot of our, our cases. It's that dependency map. So now, you know, we've been running it for over a year and now we're actually looking at, you know, I think it is time to turn on Jaeger. Some of these teams are ready for it. It's going to be great. Um, architectural governance, you'll see in the demo, they have great live uh, real-time inventories of the stuff in AWS, of the stuff in Kubernetes. You can see Yes, these things are built, and I'll discuss in a moment some real-world cases where that's helped us um, debug some issues. Uh, one thing that has always impressed me about, about OpsCruise is they're pretty honest about what machine learning can bring. Um, I hear a lot of things about how machine learning is going to make our job easier, and I felt like with Connected Car, we had a really good use case um, on, on working with machine learning and, and not getting those kind of useless alerts that say, Hey, your CPU spiked 300% and it went from, you know, 0.01 to, to 0.03. Like, I don't care about that. That sounds like a service doing its work, right? I have plenty of CPUs. That's not an alert. I get it's an anomaly. Who cares? Um, Connected Car had a great use case where we're ingesting lots of telemetry from different providers. And I don't mean open telemetry like Prometheus metrics, I mean like vehicle information, vehicle telemetry. And it's really easy to tell when a provider is down. Hey, you're not getting any data from Ford. You're not getting any data from GM because um, the data in has gone to zero. It's a lot more difficult to spot, hey, your data seems like 20% off of what it usually is. 
where it usually takes into account the kind of sinusoidal pattern of our telemetry throughout the day as people are renting vehicles, returning vehicles, driving, shutting them off. Um, and so having you know, machine learning plugged into that to be able to tell us this is slightly off, that's slightly off, it's way easier than having to look at a graph and decide that, just super great, because that is one of the things that we were doing back in, in the VM days, is like we were literally looking at a Grafana graph and going, okay, when I zoom out, the sine wave is off here, and I don't know why. Um, I want to talk quickly before the demo, I'm running out of time here, about the features that I, I really like and give you a few real world examples. Um, we talked a little bit about tracing um, and whether or not teams are ready for it and how the ops crews app map has kind of served in for us in, in lieu of super involved distributed tracing. Um, you know, if you have something where you expect two services to communicate, you can see latency on that. We had uh, something migrate from on-prem and they used to have their database right next to them. And they were really concerned like, hey, when we move away and the database isn't right next to us and we have to call to RDS and that's a managed service, what if that latency is too high? And we were able to look in there and say like, well, here's your latency to RDS. It's, you know, milliseconds or less. So you're going to be fine. And they were able to see real world, it's fine. And not just have somebody say, yeah, it's going to be fast enough. Like we have, it's, it's private. Don't worry about it. So it's really cool to be able to prove that kind of thing. If you have workloads that are um, like burdened by some, some resource constraint that's non-obvious, so Kafka partitions, for example. If you have a container come up and it's connecting to a Kafka topic with 10 partitions and it wants to use eight of them, well, that's fine. If somebody says, hey, that server's, uh, you know, that, that container is under a lot of load, I'm going to scale it out. I'm going to put two or three more containers on there. Well, they don't realize that they're bound by the number of Kafka partitions. They won't know that at least one and a half of those containers aren't doing any work because there's no more partitions for them to attach to. Um, and so we're able to kind of see that in the app map that like, oh yeah, you've got a bunch of these things running and, you know, maybe you could say that the pods readiness or liveness should catch that, but depending on how it's coded, it might not. And being able to kind of see that those connections aren't happening um, is really awesome to just kind of anchor discussions in what's happening and not what we think might be happening. Um, Kubernetes issues is great. There's a node map that the Caesar will show you. The uh, machine learning there is really reliable. It kind of lets us know if we have nodes that have problems. We have some um, workloads on spot instances. So it's cool to kind of see disruptions in there and just kind of a general um, like accounting for, for all of our stuff that's in Kubernetes. Uh, for people who aren't used to Kubernetes, maybe like, you know, for people on my team or people who are embedded in the dev team, they're used to running kubectl commands, but a lot of people aren't. Opscrews as SSO, once that was enabled, we could kind of send these links to people, draw app maps and show like, here's what's going on, here's what's going on, check these links. And that was awesome. They didn't need to, you know, navigate through Grafana or know how to make kubectl commands to see what was going on with things, which was awesome. Time travel is a feature that like, I really wanted to put on this slide, like it works <laughs> because when I first saw it, I, I, I don't think I'm a negative person, but I was like, there's no way that works. Um, and it works like amazing. Uh, we've, we've had containers where we were seeing evictions. Um, we had a container with really spiky workloads and we knew that like, Nodes were having eviction events, but we could not pin the original culprit. Like what was the thing that was using all the memory? Because whenever we looked, the eviction had already happened and everything had been rescheduled. Like where was the reason that it first started? Because sometimes the first app that's evicted is not necessarily the app. Like maybe something didn't go over its limit. It just used too much on the node. And we were able to kind of look back. We, we realized it might be this workload. And we were able to look back in time travel and say, here's the moment that it spiked and here's when all the eviction events happened. We isolated that workload onto its own class of nodes and those problems went away completely. So are there other ways to accomplish that and get that same information? Probably, um, but the time travel is, is super cool. There's another kind of quick one that's on this slide where you get an ECR outage and the downside about ECR outages is like, you can't pull new containers. It's running is fine. But if anything restarts or is redeployed and gets rescheduled somewhere, it's not going to be able to pull the container. 
And so we had that happening to a couple workloads during the outage. And we used time travel to see where they used to be scheduled and just pin them onto those nodes so, so that we could take advantage of the node cache and kind of avoid an extended downtime issue. Um, I really like that we're able to look at a high level at the platform to answer generic questions like, well, how are things spanned across on these different availability zones? That's really useful for us. Um, and with Ops Cruise, like we've really found a partner that understands all these open source tools. Um, from the very first parts that we paired with them, we could tell like they were in this as much as we were. Um, sometimes other partners, like they know where their tool touches open source, but as for like, how does Prometheus work? Like what's the most optimum Prometheus configuration? They may not know, or it depends on who you talk to. Like some people will really know, some people don't. Um, really everybody at Ops Cruise that we've paired with anyway has been super, super knowledgeable about the underlying open source foundations. That's been awesome for us. It solves that kind of day two, what are we doing with all these open source tools questions. Um, and I'll want to hand it over to Caesar. Now there's one more question I'll, I'll answer, which is uh, the idea of the number of teams involved in developing this and the total number of people. So my uh, DevOps group is relatively small. Um, we built out this platform with connected car. So not including the connected car development team. I think we had like five or six DevOps people. Today we have like 12 um, and there are lots of application developers. Um, like hundreds of application developers on these platforms now. And that spans at least a dozen teams um, at Avis and, and growing for, for different groups that are deploying into this platform today. All right, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, th thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, sharing that, uh, you know, a lot of that digital transformation you guys are going through. And thanks for uh, a lot of the kind, kind words that you said about uh, about Ops. We we're really glad to hear that. And uh, you know, it is it is very awesome to get to work with um, with with Avis as well. You know, the, the teams there, just everybody's on I me. Mean, Avis is, is really, you know, I, it's probably my ignorance. But when when I first started working, I didn't understand the level of complexity and technology that really was involved with you know with Avis themselves. And uh, you know, it's been really really awesome getting to work with with uh, the Avis team and. And, uh, and, and with people that really know the technology and that really were leveraging open source and spoke our language as well with, with Kubernetes and, and, and modern. So it was awesome. Um, so uh, it's, it's a great relationship. Now, um, I am gonna share my screen as well and we will continue uh, uh, talking. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of questions that have uh, come in. I think we'll leave those uh, towards the tail end of the Q&A session. That way we can, we can actually show you guys what we're talking about. In, uh, in an actual demo, but let me let me share my screen here. Um, so really briefly, I want to give you guys a tour of what Opscrews actually is, what we do, and how we do it. Right. So we are um, a essentially a modern observability platform uh, built with the idea that you don't need to come in and recreate a bunch of agents and find different ways of pooling data. You know, especially as it comes to these modern workloads like Kubernetes and cloud. You know, the cloud the cloud providers provide um, access to the to the data through their APIs and for modern platforms such as Kubernetes right which you know has been you know kind of in my opinion is practically winning the orchestration war at this point um, you know the 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 whole issue of how do I pull data has really been solved the there's no need for companies to go in and find new ways to get metrics from containers you know see advisors doing that you don't need to go in and develop a new way to get um, data from nodes you have node exporter and then you have Prometheus grabbing all the data from the exporters and having it in a single place and now you can leverage all that data right so we didn't set out to reinvent uh, data collection what we're really doing is uh, doing two things we are uh, unifying that data in a single place, so traces, configurations, and metrics, and uh, and uh, network data, and and then what we're doing is we're actually um, building uh, models around those entities and learning what is normal operating behavior for those different entities, 
and telling people when there's something wrong with their environments and with their applications. So some of the some of the new challenges I do want to call out um, uh, in, in modern environments as, as companies move to cloud or cloud-like, even if they're in, if you're in data centers, but you're moving to modern development practices and release practices, uh, it's it's still very much applicable. You have complexity. You have a lot of um, dependencies on different pieces that are out of your control. You might be depending on third-party applications or simply microservices that are part of somebody else's uh, team and that you really can't have any say over other than, hey, this is maybe not working. Please take a look at it, right? And then the, the dynamism, you know, as we were talking about releases and all the changes that are constantly going in, you know, you have, you have many, uh, many people that are deploying even many times a day into production, right? That used to be, of course, an unheard of. Now it's it's becoming common, but again, it brings its own challenges. Uh, well, what changed? Uh, which release broke my which release broke my uh, code or broke my application, et cetera. So, um, and then the big challenge with, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is the disjointed model. Right, you have all this data. You have some platforms taking in your metrics, and you have some platforms taking in your logs, and others taking in your traces and configuration data. You might not be doing anything around. Then you have another, you know, for for network data and understanding what's talking to what. All that data is is out there, and many of the companies that we talk to have that data, but it's disjointed. Um, my like the my one of my favorite words is like context, right? When you have an issue, when you're troubleshooting a problem, context is king, right? If you don't, if you're looking at a bunch of dashboards that are somehow related, you as an expert or um or, or the people that you're managing as experts need to be aware of keep that context in their head of what's happening across those different dashboards. That itself is a challenge, and that's something that we also um, uh, Ops is, is hoping to solve by bringing all the data in that single place with context. Uh, that way, you don't need to have everybody be an expert and remember everything while they're troubleshooting. Right? So, um, what kind of data do you need for this? Right. So, you're going to need application structure. You're going to need uh, to understand what dependencies are having between, uh, or what dependencies exist between between the different entities. So, uh, not only the service to service, but um, you know, you have a container, what orchestra, you know, what, what orchestration node is it running on? And that node, is it running in AWS, is it running GCP, where is that, where's that piece running? Um, how do my different, you know, from the application level, how does that relate down to the infrastructure level? On top of that, once you have that kind of data, you also need curated knowledge. Right? So um, we kind of call that concept as, as me in a box, right? Being able to tell you, um, you know, when something is wrong and, and uh, where it's wrong. Um, you know, one of the big things, and I'll show you in a sec, we don't require teams to go in and select metrics and set thresholds. Um, that's where that curated knowledge portion comes in because we, um, we as a platform provide that data without you needing to have experts on absolutely everything. Um, once you have that data, right, you also need um, application state. How are those applications themselves behaving? Are they up? Are they down? What kind of uh, what kind of traffic are they receiving? So all that we we uh, we also take into account on in our platform. And finally, you need the up understanding, which kind of comes in from the app state. Once you have, you know, what are my traffic levels? Um, am I up? Am I down? Um, you know, who am I talking to? Then that's where the ML piece comes in, and we learn what which of those behaviors is normal. What does your application typically do? How does it behave at fifty requests? How does it behave at how does it behave at one thousand requests? What is the CPU doing? What is the memory doing? What is the, um, your your file system doing at these different levels of requests and types of requests? So all those pieces together um, uh, are are important for when you're building a smart layer. And so again, that is what Omscrew set out to do. But how do we really get that data? Um, well, uh, this is how we get that data, right? So this is um, uh, th this screen is essentially showing the different tools that we can leverage and there's others, right? But these are kind of like our core tools that we leverage for bringing in this data. Um, so you'll see that number one, we support the open telemetry standard, right? So um, uh, we're, we're building out uh, increasing support for open telemetry as, as, their, um, uh, as their collection pieces become more GA. Uh, but you know, the, all the things that we are also taking in are things from the CNCF, as uh, uh, Matt was mentioning earlier, things like Prometheus data for metrics, right, from logs, so Loki, FluentD, for traces. Again, kind of, there's kind of a mix of the open telemetry standard. We use Jaeger as the back end, but really anything that's open telemetry compliant on your front end, it doesn't matter if you use a mixture of like Jaeger and open Zipkin and open telemetry libraries for instrumentation, you know, that's all supported. Uh, for flows, we take data from Istio, but also, um, we take data from eBPF, right? So um, we leverage eBPF to look at not only what 
entities are talking to each other. So, you know, container to container um, calls, but also um, we're able to get URL level data. Again, still without tracing. I'll show you guys that in, in a second, but really once you deploy Opscrews, you can see what, what, what is our app map um, all in a single place um, without the need for trace. Though again, we do support tracing. We take data from Kubernetes, right? So we take the config data and, and I'll show you that in a second as well. Uh, we take changes from different CI CD platforms. So Jenkins, Spinnaker and, and, and other places, right? And then data finally from cloud. So again, we go to the cloud and we, we bring back the different entities that are powering your environment. So you might have a, an EKS cluster in AWS that's being run by you know, uh, 20, 30, 50 um, uh, nodes, maybe more, right? That are maybe even auto scaling in and out all the time, kind of like an Avis's um, environment. And absolutely, you know, we support all that data. Um, this is a quick view of our architecture, uh, as mentioned earlier, right? So we take data from Kubernetes, we take data from cloud, we take data from containers, we also support virtual machines, um, and also serverless, which is kind of, you know, bundled into cloud here, abstracted away, but we also do support serverless. Um, so we take data from all those, and really, um, we, we leverage, as we mentioned, these open source platforms, so Loki for logs, Prometheus for metrics and, and the Jaeger backend for grabbing those traces from, you see the containers and virtual machines feeding those platforms. On top of that, um, you have uh, Kubernetes itself feeding data and as I mentioned, cloud to our gateways, right? So we really have five types of gateways. I know this is getting a little bit into the weeds, so I'll just speak to it briefly. If you guys have any questions around it, we can talk more about it, but we have a metrics gateway. So that's gonna take data directly from Prometheus. We have a trace gateway. That's again, that middleman between, between um, the, the Jaeger platform and our Opscrews cloud. Um, and the Kubernetes gateway, again, the middleman between all that Kubernetes data and object discovery, et cetera, and our cloud. Uh, finally, uh, sorry, uh, cloud gateway, which is also gonna do that discovery of those entities in cloud configuration in cloud and send that data off into Opscrew SaaS. And finally, the log gateway, which is gonna be interacting in this case, you know, in this example with Loki, right? So these gateways are super, super lightweight containers a uh, couple hundred megs um, in, in memory and maybe like a, a quarter of a CPU, super lightweight um, uh, pods. And it's it's one per telemetry type, they're mix and match. You can, if you're not, if you say, you know what, I'm not using tracing, then that's fine. We, we don't deploy the trace gateway. But the point is that we have these super lightweight, super secure um, uh, uh, containers that are just gonna take that data from your existing platforms and send it, send it off into off screws, right? Um, any questions about architecture we can, we can discuss. Um, as part of the Q&A. Um, you know, I, there, there's, a, there's a couple of things, but just in the interest of time, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna skip over a couple of these uh, slides. Um, but I do wanna call out some of, the, some of the types of problems that we do resolve. So things like application slowdowns and app crashes and misconfiguration of different entities. Um, we also uh, look at uh, improper uh, balancing, uh, misconfigured load balancing, uh, connection pool saturations for different uh, databases. Um, we also do a lot of, uh, the, you know, a lot of the observability platforms, you know, are, are, are starting to do support for Kubernetes, but we were built from the ground up um, in the Kubernetes world and Kubernetes environment. So we do a lot of, yeah, you know, the Kubernetes layer um, uh, problem detection. So things like missing config maps, causing containers and pods not to come up, um, node evictions uh, because of, you know, let's say you have a High, high disk utilization and your node starts kicking out your, your pods, you know, we'll detect that and, and alert you on that. Um, and then, you know, for cloud infrastructure, availability of the nodes and of the volumes. And again, the load balancing performance also applies here to, uh, to cloud. And then as mentioned earlier, serverless. So, uh, you know, uh, abnormal performance and cold start delays and, and startup issues, et cetera. So all those, there's a lot of different types of problems. And what I'll do is I'll actually jump into um the uh the demo here and uh, that way you can get a real taste for what opscrews actually does so uh this is our opscrews uh, uh demo environment right and we do have support for dark mode which actually i think this view kind of lends itself a little bit better to dark mode um you know by default by the way i have some grouping going on here um by default we, we collect uh, a bunch of different rich uh, data about these entities. So not only the monitoring and observability data, um, but also uh, the configuration. So if I click on any one of these entities, right? So for, so for example, actually I, I should give a quick tour. We have things like pods, right? These little stacked squares are, are the pods. If I double click on any one of these entities, I can actually see the containers that are running inside of those pods. And I can see, as mentioned earlier, we, we grab data from cloud. This is an elastic load balancer that's running in the cloud. Um, these are the Kubernetes services. We also have 
calls out to third parties. Um, in this case, um, Opscrews from this environment, Opscrews is a third party um, that we're sending data out to, as mentioned earlier in the architecture, and also things like calls directly from the internet. I think we also have an RDS instance somewhere. Yeah, here we go. We have, a, we have an RDS instance. And each one of these entities, so if I click, for example, on that RDS instance, right, I'm in the context of that RDS instance, I can see the configuration for that particular RDS instance. So I can see the allocated storage and the port that it's being exposed on, the subnet that it's part of, um, and, uh, you know, preferred maintenance. So this is a bunch of data related to, to that um, RDS instance. Now, it changes when I look at, for example, this Redis uh, pod. So now if I click on the pod itself, now I'm looking at uh, metadata for the pod, right? So for this Redis card pod, I can see the labels attached to it. We pick those up automatically and we leverage that for the grouping that you saw a little bit earlier. Um, IP addresses, again, uh, ports that are being exposed. And then we can also look at metrics, logs. Uh, so I can drill down, actually, let me uh, find something a little bit richer. But for example, um, let's say Node Exporter, right? So I'll just I'll just pick on Node Exporter because I know it has logs and stuff. So Node Exporter, um, again, same thing. I'm picking up uh, labels and different pieces of metadata. Um, I can also look directly at the entire manifest. So if I click on Detailed View, right? I can now I'm looking at the whole manifest for um, this particular Kubernetes workload, right? So what Matt was mentioning earlier that now teams don't need to, you know, teams that are, don't know how to use kubectl, they don't need to do a kubectl, get pods, dash o, yaml, and then look, they don't need to do all this stuff. Now they can just say, well, I'm looking for node exporter. Okay, here it is. All right, well, what's what's the running config? Oh, that, that's what it is. And uh, and then from here, you can also drill down into, for example, metrics, right? If I want to look at metrics, I can go directly into that. And now I can see the CPU utilization and memory utilization for these particular sets of pods. Um, and also one of the cool things, so for example, when you're trying to find out what you're talking to, let's say I'm actually going to find the Prometheus um, pod because I know that it's talking to a lot of different exporters. And so here's actually our Prometheus pod, right? If I click on Prometheus, I'm looking at Prometheus in that context. And I can also see the config maps attached to it, by the way. So down here, you see the config maps. And this is actual, you know, the, the scraping rules, et cetera. But um, I can click on connections, right? And by the way, I'm going to switch back into uh, to light mode. I can click on connections for Prometheus. And now I see everything that Prometheus is talking to, right? So Prometheus is going out and scraping these different targets and I can see what ports are being scraped on. So I can see it's scraping node exporter over port 9100. So I can look at all this data. I can see um, what the different, you know, the, the level four data about invites, out bytes, packets in, packets out. And also um, where supported level seven data. So I can see latency average. So for example, scraping C advisor is taking about one second on average. Um, so all this data is available um, without tracing, right? So again, we do support tracing, but this particular view is built um, with, uh, with, without tracing, we're leveraging eBPF. So about a minute or two after you deploy Opscrews, this whole, right, which you can play around with, um, you can play around with the, with the organization of this, but this whole map, right, is, is built automatically leveraging EPF and it's updated in real time. So um, as you deploy different workloads into your clusters, and into your environments, you can you know, see um, these, these different uh, services interacting with each other over what ports, over what latency, and that builds into the rest of our anomaly detection. Um, uh, and, and so I'll, I'll actually just show that here in a sec here. Um, but I just want to give a tour of that. Um, now, there are different pieces. So for example, our cloud, uh, actually, I'll go a different one. So let's let's say this, this is an EKS cluster, by the way, inside of, um, inside of uh, AWS for this particular demo. But if I click on a pod, I can actually look at um, a, a pods, uh, what we call our, our actually, let's just say a container. A container is the three layer view, right? So what we have is this three layer view shows us um, the application level. So the container is running on top of this uh, Kubernetes node, right? And I can see the node name that it's running on, some of the neighbors on that node. But in turn, this node is running on this EC2 instance. So I can see that there's this instance called lab two node four, and I can see the EC2 type in the region. And if I click on go to inframap, this takes us to what Matt was mentioning earlier. So now I'm in the context of that particular node, but I'll kind of uh, push that away for a sec. I'm in the context of that node. And this is what Matt was talking about, like um, where, where does your um, uh, data live, right? Are, are your entities living in the proper subnets and the proper regions, right? So we, we will call out and map out, right? You, you're running inside of AWS and in the US West 2 region and the US West 2 availability zone. You have a VPC here with a couple of different subnets and all these are AC2 instances. So this is, this is constantly updated 
um, to reflect the latest state of all your, your, um, your workloads that are deployed inside of AWS. And now I can click on this EC2 instance and look at all the metadata attached to it, just like we saw for the pods. And I can see the root device name and I can see the status, whether it's running or not. And then I can see metrics and I can drill down into metrics just like we did earlier. Um, so all this data, all this data is available. And again, constantly in real time. Um, sorry, I see that there's a bunch of um, uh, questions here. Let me, let me take a quick look here. Um, do we have the desire to monitor the contents of more detailed packet data that cannot be obtained by services such as OSS monitoring tools and data dog, for example, by services such as Gigamon. Um, more at the like actual network, like between switches and routers, that is not the core of our application. It's much more at the application level and the um, services interacting with each other. Um, if there's an interest for that, I mean, we'd love to talk about that. We can probably take that offline, Shun. But, um, but yeah, currently we're not like getting that deep into the packet inspection level uh, quite yet. Um, let me see which framework technology is the Opsus web app built on that uh, we can probably take offline. I, I'll have to talk to the team. I, I am not sure. I know we use a mixture of a bunch of different uh, technologies. I know there's some Angular in there, um, but uh, that's about as much as I know we're, we're, what the actual front end that we are looking at is built on. Um, can you link through Opsus directly to the service interface UIs for some of those services such as Prometheus? Sorry, Ian, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. If you want to clarify that a little bit more, um, I'll be happy to answer that. And then what is the pricing model for ops crews? Um, I, we charge by container. I am not the guy to talk to about pricing and that's not just me dodging the question. I really am not. But if you, um, uh, if you want to reach out through the, if you go to opscrews.com, there's a chat box on there. Um, or if you want to email info at opscrews.com, um, we can happily answer that question, but, uh, but we do charge. Um, by VM or by container, and it's all in one pricing. I know we, you know, it's not like different features are are um, are priced differently. So so it's all you get all full featured for the same price. Um, that's a good question about how long our log stored. Um, I will answer that in just a sec because I know we're coming up on uh, on time. I will answer that, but I do want to show one last piece um, before end because I know we're pretty much uh, out of time. But I wanted to show one of the cool things that we do with the ML, right? So let me, um, I wanna show this particular um, uh, problem. This is our problem screen, by the way, I clicked on alerts here and this is our problem screen. I filtered, but you know, there's there's lots of different types of, of alerts here that you can see, I'll just get rid of that for a sec. But there's like response time breaches and these are some, some ML alerts that our machine learning has detected some deployment issues. So for example, like this payment server is not coming up. You want three replicas, only two are available. And we can tell you Things that you know why they're broken. If you click this analyze tab, you see a really cool fishbone feature, and this fishbone um, RCA feature tells you what's actually broken. So in this particular case, you have some runtime failures and some startup uh, failures, particularly around pod scheduling. And just because I can see it right away, I see this insufficient CPU, right? So this workload is trying to be scheduled. There's not enough CPU here. It's requesting 2,000 millicores, and there's not enough for that. So. That's the reason why this isn't coming up. But what I wanted to show, um, again, because again, I know we're out of time, we're almost out of time, is this particular uh, anomaly, right? So we have an SLO breach on this um, Nginx service, right? And there's a bunch of data here as to, you know, especially for uh, if there's any ML people out there, there's all these um, details onto why this triggered. And But the fun view is here in Analyze. And what this analyze view does is it shows us a slice of the app map, right? Nobody built this, this map. Nobody came in and set any thresholds on here. What this does is it automatically detects that there's some violations here. And then we look upstream, downstream, up the stack, down the stack to find if there are any issues. So really, this is the root of our anomaly. Oops. This is the root of our anomaly, this particular Nginx failure. It's at 15 seconds, right? But now, Obscurs has automatically detected that there are some issues downstream in the red that are causing problems, right? So I can click on them and see what's going on. So card cache has this spike in red, right? You can see here, all of a sudden, um, you see these different metric types that have um, uh, violated and you see like response time increasing drastically and we'll call out the values and the anomalous um, value, you know, normal, what's anomalous, what that percentage increases. We've also got an increase um, in, re in response errors looks like. So we've gone from zero to 20 errors, basically all the transactions. And so there's, you know, we, we call these pieces out but you know, this is at cart cache. So what's going on downstream that's causing that issue? Well, cart server, it looks like cart server doesn't have any pods. So that would make sense that we're suddenly getting a bunch of errors. And finally, if I go to this uh, final piece, this final leg, it looks like um, we don't have a pod that's able to serve because we have an invalid image tag, right? Somebody's using an empty image 
with a default tag, which is never going to load. So we did that all automatically. I know, I know that was kind of rushed through, but um, we did that all automatically. Nobody came in here and sent any thresholds. Nobody came in here and sent any uh, rules. This is just something that the Optrus platform does out of the box um, with the combination of all that data we talked about earlier on top of you know, the, the, the machine learning that's in place. Um, so uh, with that, as I said, I'll hand it back to the questions now. The, it was asked, um, how long do we keep the logs? And the reality of it is I think logs are stored for, uh, most data by default is about 15 days, okay? We're not meant to be the long-term store uh, of your data. That data is already living in, and I'll, and I'll come back to this, your logs are living in, in, in Loki, right? You have full control of your logs. We're not going to go in and say, yeah, feed us your logs, and then we'll charge you, you know, 10x what cloud storage costs. And, <laughs> and that's something that Matt was alluding to earlier, right? You guys own your own data, right, Matt? You can attach as many gigs of storage as you want to Loki and go back 50 years, you know, in logs if you want. Um, Opscrews is really leveraging that data for real-time and near real-time analysis of your problems, of the of the issues, so that, you know, we tell you, hey, this is what's wrong, um, this is what's broken, and, you know, you can, you can drill down contextually into logs, right, when you're looking at a problem, right, in this context of this problem, you can click on logs, you can look at configs, you can look at events, et cetera, in the context of a problem, and, but about 15 days later, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, pull those logs, but you still have them available fully, um, inside of the Loki platform and inside of Prometheus for metrics. So hopefully that answers your, your question. That's definitely one of my favorite things about working with you guys is like, as I mentioned earlier, you really get and embrace the open source side of it. So like we can do the kind of log storage stuff that we may need to do for compliance or whatever um, and keep what we need uh, without having to like pay double for that, which is, which is really awesome. Keep control of those things. and. You know, the same thing with like custom metrics, right? I don't have to think like, oh no, I made extra custom metrics and that's going to change how much I'm being charged. Like, right. no, it's just Prometheus metrics. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the few monitoring vendors that that I have found in my experience that like doesn't try to lock you in, which I think is cool. Yeah, and that's exactly that's exactly the philosophy, right? We're um, that's the philosophy, I think, of, of open source and not being locked in and also the philosophy of options that we continue. You know, right now, options might be the best solution if at some point you need to pivot away. We hope not, but, you know, it, the, the, the capability is there, right? We're not locking you in and saying, nope, now you move away from options, now you lose all your, you know, telemetry data and you have to find a different way to, to monitor and collect data. That's not what we're about. Um, I know we, we, um, we can continue um, ans answering questions, but just so you guys know, we do have a pre version of options that supports up to five Kubernetes nodes. Um, so if you want to sign up, just head on to obscures.com and you can sign up there. Um, there's another question that came in, which alerting ticketing integrations are available? ServiceNow, Slack, Microsoft Teams, basically, uh, yes, all of those and more, right? So we support um, basically any modern notification system. You can do SMS, um, we can do web. We use Ops Genie. Yeah, yeah, they use, Op yeah, ABC uses Ops Genie, so we can send out to Ops Genie, ServiceNow, et cetera. So really any, any modern, um, any modern platform with uh, with an API email as well, if you're so inclined. So yeah. Email alerts are just so wrong. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> I thought the world moves on email alerts. I thought that's what makes the world turn. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, does, does this mean that if I set one year for log storage? I can search and analyze that data through the Opscrews UI. Uh, no, in the Opscrews UI, no, we, we will call that data. We take a temporary copy of your data. Um, and again, about 15 days later, uh, it, it's gone. But again, the underlying data at Loki that's running in your cluster, um, you can access that Loki endpoint. By the way, if you guys aren't leveraging any of these tools and you have um, a brand new kind of greenfield environment, um, we'll deploy these, these underlying tools for you, right? We'll deploy Prometheus, we'll deploy Loki, et cetera. But those endpoints are accessible in your cluster. You can go directly to the Loki endpoint and, and have that data. Or in Grafana. Yeah, or in, or in Grafana as well, yes. Yeah, we usually do long-term log analysis and like pulling stuff just through the Grafana Loki integration. Um, like we usually, we really view Opscrews as like our, our real-time, you know, anomaly detection, like first place you go to debug an issue as opposed to like, like Caesar said, like the source of truth for long-term storage of these things. We kind of take that on ourselves based on our own compliance requirements. Right. 
All right. Well, thank you so much to Matt and Caesar for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much.